I'm Gavin Serkin and we're at Super Return Africa in Cape Town and we've had a fascinating discussion this morning. One of the uh, panelists was with me here, Zane Latif, who is the founder and the CEO of and the principal of TLG Capital, which is an $85 million private equity vehicle and also structured finance vehicle with a lot of different investments all over Africa. So Zane, thanks for joining us. I want to ask you first of all about some of the challenges that you found investing in Africa because I, I know that was part of the discussion just now and you raised some important points there. Well, thank you, Gavin. It's a pleasure to be here. I think uh, when we think about Africa, we have to remember that there's not been a lot of historical work that's been done in terms of investing in the region. So you're looking at the last 20 years when really uh, private money started flowing in. And as a result, you're sort of starting everything from scratch. So you expect to find some bumps in the road. You expect to find some challenges. And you find the ones that are more obvious. Uh, clearly, the currency issues, uh, the volatility in the currency makes it difficult to plan your investments. Um, the manpower, the infrastructure challenges. Um, you know, Africa has also got, at least historically, a lot of governance um, issues on the political side. And uh, we've always made the point at TLG that when you look at India and Africa, they've got similar challenges, particularly infrastructure, political, ethnic um, situations. But uh, what India has been able to do extremely well has been to develop a very vibrant private sector, mm -hmm. and uh, it's particularly on the SME side. So what's India doing right that Africa, and we're, we're generalizing here, I realize, but you know, from your experience in well, Africa? Well, I think the, the biggest difference will definitely be with the fact that Africa is just a mass of different countries compared to India, which is simply one country. Mm. So the challenges of 50 plus different types of governments, different types of um, ethnic breakdowns, etc., cetera, um, contained within the country um, is always going to be more difficult than a place like India where no matter the fact that they've got similar challenges, at least they are united and they have one uh, country to deal with. And I think as a people, Indians tend to be very entrepreneurial. They're very focused on education. They're very focused on trying to move forward. Um, and I think that's something that we've started to see more and more in Africa anyway, as governments have focused a lot on education. Mm -hmm. It was one of the things that post-partition, India did really well in, which was focusing on developing these schools that created a generation of people uh, that started seeing um, education as a tool of getting out of their challenges. The other big uh, positive, I think, that has, we've seen was that in the 60s and 70s, when Indian students started leaving the country, they started coming back in the 90s and 2000s, bringing back all the technical know-how, all the experience they received in places like the US, like Europe, which has started to flow back in and develop these private sector in enterprises. Um, and I think we're starting to see that now in Africa. Okay, where, where in Africa? Because as you mentioned, you know, we're talking about a lot of countries here. So where, where, are you yeah. seeing, where are you seeing green shoots of the kind of activity that you like from India and, and where perhaps are there? I think you see like Kenya, you see Nigeria, you see even places like um, Uganda, and, and, uh, which I'm a very big fan of because we've done quite a few of our investments in that country. And I think you know, you, when you look at just those three, four countries that constitute a big part of the sub-Saharan economy, um, you just see that folks who have left and traditionally started to leave are now coming back. And that's who we as TLG are looking to back anyway right now. So when, you, when I look at the por portfolio investments that we've done and we look at the people that we've backed, a lot of these folks are actually people who've gone abroad, studied abroad, worked abroad, and then decided, you know what, the opportunity in our home countries are so much more mm -hmm. that let's go back and try and develop stable, defensive type businesses um, that, that work. Who's lagging in Africa? Where do you find more difficulties, more challenges? Look, I think, um, you know, and again, we have to be very careful about, because from a TLG perspective, we have certain countries that we look at more than others, mm. because we look at the Anglophone countries, and primarily it's because of the fact that we follow a legal framework, which is the English law, right? So if you look at Francophone countries or Lusophone countries like Angola, Mozambique, because they follow a different legal framework, we tend to avoid investing in those countries. So for me to make a judgment between Francophone and Anglophone would be a little bit uh, right. difficult. Um, but I will say that you know, we are, in terms of lagging behind, I don't think it's people coming back that's lagging behind. I think places like Zimbabwe um, could do so much better because one of the things that Mugabe did do post-independence was focus on education and getting his people 
to a, to a, a state where they are probably amongst the most educated in the right. region. And what you see is a country that is performing so much well below its potential, and that's the tragedy of Zimbabwe. Mm. And not getting into the political side of what he did was right or wrong, and everyone has a view on that, but we can all agree that Zimbabwe should be operating at a, a level much b b beyond where it is currently at. Okay, so, so TLG is invested in a huge array of different sectors from uh, pharmaceuticals and... Pharmaceuticals, and healthcare, banks, financial institutions, financial inclusion, water production, agriculture. Right. So where, where out of all of that array are you most excited about? Where is TLG really pushing to sector-wise, ge geography So the, the most wise? exciting aspect when you think about where the biggest opportunities are in Africa is, is in healthcare. Mm. A huge believer in the healthcare story. Um, but it's a very difficult story because with healthcare you need to bring in governments, you need to bring in operators, you need to bring in machinery, you need to bring in doctors and nurses, qualified folks. It's not easy to do. Um, we, we, we have done three, four investments in that space, but it's a lot of effort that goes in. And what makes it work? What, what's the secret to uh, so uh, The secret sauce for us is that, you know, I think we've done cancer treatment, we've done AIDS and malaria, we've invested in the oldest medical facilities in Liberia. So we've seen a good plethora of, of, of uh, investments that, and I think the key ingredient for us is the right operator. And the right operator tends to be more from Asia than Europe just because in Asia and India, they've been able to do world-class treatments, first world treatments, but at prices that are affordable. Um, when you look at HIV, which is one of the biggest killers of diseases in, uh, diseases in, in Africa, you had a situation where you were getting treated for $10,000 per patient per year 20 years ago. CIPLA brought that down to a dollar per person per day. Their triple therapy that they did uh, a big agreement with, and, from $10,000 per person per year to $365 per person per year meant that for the first time you had the ability of treating patients who would otherwise not be treated. And because you know, India and Africa, there's been a long history of people migrating from India to Africa, there's a big community um, in, in the region as well, it means that you can bring in technical know-how into the region at a much more affordable cost whether it be at Indian doctors, Indian technicians, Indian nurses, and that I think gives a cost of product that's more affordable in the African space. Mm -hmm. and, and looking at the financing of some of these deals, mm -hmm. uh, what's been significant about TLG in the last few years is moving away from the typical private equity structure into more of a combined uh, blended finance structure. Um, well, I th tell yeah. us about that, what, what, sure. what works in terms of structuring have you found so just, I think the guiding principle for what we do in Africa is flexibility. So you have to be flexible in Africa. Anybody who tells you otherwise, I just think has never really spent time enough in the region. And the reason we say that is because I think private equity is a big buzzword. It's a word that's used a lot in the US and Europe as a means of getting financing to companies. But if you really think about it, the characteristics, the defining characteristics of getting that working in, in the Western world versus Africa, they're not there, the building blocks. And what are the two building blocks of private equity? It's cheap debt and it's efficient exit markets, neither of which exist in pure Sub-Saharan Africa. So when you're going into a region like Uganda or Ghana or Liberia, and you're gonna say, yes, I'm gonna exit in the IPO markets in five years, and you're gonna borrow locally, it's more hope than reality. <laughs> um, so our view is, well, if you're going to be successful in Africa, and you look at anyone who's been successful in Africa, when you look at local entrepreneurs, local businessmen, what you find, the folks who have been able to go through the highs and the lows, the political turbulence, the economic upwards and downwards um, of the country, have been the most successful, right? And that's the approach we wanted to take, because in a private equity life fund, you have five years, maybe seven, if you're lucky, nine, but in year seven or year eight, if there's an election, good luck trying to exit. You're gonna take a massive multiple decrease. So for us, it's always been long-term focus, long-term investments, and partnering up with the right folks to walk with you through that journey. And um, based on those principles, we thought to ourselves, let's be a little bit more flexible. Let's work with local partners on the ground who know these economies, who have the relationships, right? So. When you're dealing in 50 plus countries, um, you're not going to have relationships 
deep in each and every country. You're not going to have the ability to understand the local enforcement laws of each and every country, the court systems of each and every country. So bringing banks into play, building, build, bringing in multilateral organizations that can provide credit insurance, that can provide um, support, these are critical factors that we use in how we try to invest in the region. Self-liquidating instruments. I mean, they all sound so simple mm -hmm. you know, when, you, when you talk about it, but in fact, for a lot of these countries, when you're investing as debt plus warrants or equity options, et cetera, for a lot of these countries, they don't really have the laws relating to these type of investments. Mm -hmm. So you're working you know, and you're innovating all the time, yeah. and each country has a different uh, approach to how, you, to how they take on these investments. Okay, Zane, thank you for taking us through that. And I no didn't problem. mention any of the stuff that would have embarrassed you, like being <laughs> the youngest VP at Merrill Lynch and graduating well, from Cass Business School. Uh, this is Gavin Sirkin at Super Return Africa in Cape Town. Thank you so much, Gavin. Appreciate it. Thank you.